Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Today on Spotlight, meet lawyer and activist Margaret Bush Wilson, who broke barriers throughout life as an African-American woman. Plus, a WashU professor writes a book about how to fix racial inequality in the workplace. And then WashU researchers develop a breathalyzer test for COVID, RSV, and the flu. But first, a world premiere play from the writer of Selma first ran in St. Louis. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. This may look like old newsreel footage of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but actually it's the actor Enoch King, no relation, playing Dr. King on stage at the not Black Room. Not now when we have come so far and sacrificed so much. King the actor portrays King the activist in a new play about the rough and tumble fight for voting rights in the Deep South in the mid 60s. It was a bloody battle remembered today simply by the name of the place where it happened. Selma. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Borrowing from the lyrics of that civil rights anthem, the play is called Hold On. This is our moment. It is the first We're show of the 2024 season at the Black Rep, and the first time it has been performed anywhere. This is the 24th world premiere for the Black Rep. Mr. President, this telling of the story is framed through the tumultuous tug of war between Dr. King and President Johnson, who had similar agendas but different timetables. What I tell people a lot when I'm trying to give them the shorthand of what the play is, I tell them basically, if you know the film Selma, this is it on stage. And that's largely because the man who wrote the play also wrote the movie. His name is Paul Webb, and he is neither black nor American. Webb became aware of what happened in Selma while doing research for an early draft of the screenplay for Steven Spielberg's film, Lincoln. I thought, wow, why has no one written about this? And at the time, in fact, I mean, still maybe, it's one of those kind of mysteries, really. You've seen this list. Before the reckoning in Selma, blacks who tried registering to vote in the Deep South had to first correctly answer absurd and irrelevant questions. How many bubbles in the average soap bar? Application denied. You may go. What happened in Selma in March of 1965 began after an Alabama state trooper killed an unarmed civil rights protester named Jimmy Lee Jackson. To protest Jackson's killing, activists set out to march from Selma to Montgomery, but were brutally attacked by troopers and a sheriff's posse as they crossed out of Selma on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We are interrupting our Saturday night theater feature. That night, when network television showed footage of the brutality, it stirred the moral conscience of the nation. March 7th, 1965, would become known as Bloody Sunday. It is too soon to go back asking for more civil rights. The Senate isn't ready, and what's more, the country isn't ready. And I have to try and make them ready. In the play, I think that it really is Dr. King's story. And I think that as we look at history as it moves, it really tells that story in an epic fashion. Come on, Rob, then let's go to Selma. No wonder Washington's heard of Selma. In terms of the historical events that take place, I've learned how strategic everything was, even if it seemed like it was kind of just galvanized by passion. There is no Negro problem. There is no Southern problem. There is no Northern problem. There is only an American, an American problem. problem. We are met here today as Americans, not Democrats or Republicans. We are met here as Americans to solve this problem. In this play, history literally repeats itself. 
And in some ways, so has real life. It is all of us. When Paul Webb wrote the first draft of the play in 2005, the question of voting rights in America was thought to be settled law. But that has not turned out to be the case, perhaps making Hold On more timely than it was ever meant to be. That's what this play says to me. We, we're working for something that's really important as we're living in a society that is dealing with the, the avalanche of negative results of watching voting rights get dismantled. In looking at how far we've come, you can also see how much work we still have to do. And I think that that will be the takeaway from this, the struggle during the civil rights era, the sacrifices that were made, the gains that were made, are all being attacked again now. And so we really have to be vigilant and to be careful or else we are on the verge really of looking like we could repeat that history. For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hi, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. Lawyer and activist Margaret Bush Wilson broke many barriers as an African-American woman throughout her life. Public historian Cecily Hunter walks us through her career highlights. Margaret Bush Wilson blazed her own path during the time of the civil rights movement as a black woman attorney in St. Louis. She served on the local board of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as well as on the national board. She was born to James T. and Margaret Bush in 1919. She was raised in the Ville, which was, at that time, a black neighborhood that was segregated. In that neighborhood, there were many black professionals that came together in the Ville. And so she would even come across people like Julia Davis, who was her third grade teacher and taught her. Margaret Bush Wilson would participate and take part in the Ville neighborhood and all that it had to offer. She even was um, a student at Sumner High School where she became a valedictorian of her class. She pursued her undergraduate degree at Talladega College where she finished in 1940 with honors. A year prior in 1939, Wilson was awarded through the Julia Derricott Fellowship Study Abroad Program, which brought her to six different countries and she met Mahat Gandhi who motivated her to join the fight for civil rights. Her education continued in the Ville at Lincoln University School of Law, where she became the second black woman to practice law in Missouri by 1943. Her interest in legal systems led her to become involved in the landmark case, Shelley v. Kramer, 1948. She assisted with the legal proceedings following the Jefferson Bank demonstration and served the local community with Wilson and Associates for over 40 years. Next week on History Spotlight, the love story between President Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Mid-America Emmys, Tellys, Natoas, Auroras, and other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, Recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. 
If you've ever asked yourself why 50 plus years after the Civil Rights Act and why in the wake of a huge multi-billion diversity industry, we still don't have racial parity at work, I think this will give you some answers. Job contracts lay out the basics like research, teaching, and service pretty clearly. But it's really how we interact at work that can make a big difference in our careers. Getting to know your colleagues, understanding organizational culture, and finding the right people to guide and support you as you move up the ladder can all be critical to success. So when I talk about gray areas, I'm talking about the parts of our jobs that are a core part of how we work but may not be a written explicit part of the work that we do. Gray areas as I've defined them are present for workers writ large. Everyone has to understand the organizational culture. Everyone has to go through this process of trying to get a job and forming the connections and networks that they need to land in a job. While not as formal or strictly governed, these factors play a vital role for anyone navigating the work world. However, for individuals grappling with racial inequality, actively mastering these less clear-cut areas becomes particularly challenging, especially in environments that seem fair at first. For black workers, those experiences don't always land quite the same way, and there's a lot of room and opportunity for racial inequalities and racial discrimination to persist through those gray areas. It's really critical for companies to follow evidence-based steps to addressing these types of issues. At Washington University in St. Louis, Professor Adia Harvey Wingfield studies how race, gender, and class intersect to shape social interactions in the workplace. Her latest book, Gray Areas, How the Way We Work Perpetuates Racism and What We Can Do to Fix It, explores how these nuanced workplace dynamics can perpetuate racial inequalities using real-world examples and in-depth analysis. The book also offers solutions for organizations to address these challenges effectively. If you as a company want to be prepared to meet the challenges of society, if you want to be the best organization that you can, if you really want to make sure that your organization is thriving, you can't do that if you're using outdated, old, yesterday's models of what a company looks like and does and how it operates. If you really want to meet the needs of today, you got to be a diverse organization that reflects the diversity of the population. And that means being more attuned to and aware of how black workers' experiences are shaped in your organization and changing those for the better. Well, yes. we can't heal what we don't reveal. Sure, sure. Is there a way to prepare then? Now that we know what mm -hmm. it is, can I go into a job equipped for, oh, this is what I can expect mm -hmm. and how I can maybe uh, mitigate it. Yeah, I think it's useful for workers to have an idea of what to expect coming into these workplaces, that you are gonna need these connections, that you do wanna know what the organizational culture is, that you are gonna have to forge these relationships with mentors and sponsors for advancement. But I actually, want to push back a little against the idea about this being something that should come that should be grounded in what workers are doing mm -hmm. really at the core of what I want That's to argue I think part, yeah, yeah I think these have to be organizational solutions mm -hmm. I think that you said leadership as well exactly right tell exactly. us how yeah I think it's really critical for companies to follow evidence-based steps to addressing these types of issues because it shouldn't be on individual workers especially individual black workers to mm -hmm. come in and try to figure these things out so we do know that there are some steps that companies can take to try to address some of the issues that I talk about here. Uh, companies can focus on uh, mentoring programs that are available to everyone. They can change how they engage in recruitment processes so that they are more likely to attract more black workers and to hire more black workers. They can put into place programs where uh, they are focused on diversity internally and bring in people from a variety of different levels in the mm -hmm. organization and that offer the resources to put into place solutions. They can empower diversity managers who can keep people accountable and make sure that they are operating to collect data and have an eye towards these issues. So it's not a thing where there's nothing that companies can do, right? And it, and it shouldn't be a thing where black workers have to take it on themselves to identify all of these things preemptively and then structure their interactions in the workplace accordingly. That certainly doesn't hurt, yeah. but I really want to emphasize that I think organizations, again, if you're going to say that you're serious about diversity, which right. virtually all organizations do, say. you got to <laughs> step up, right? <laughs> to find out exactly how organizations can put these ideas into play, Watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. Later on Spotlight, Black Girls Do STEM. Why one scientist decided to work to change a trend.
It's an aerosol innovation at Washington University in St. Louis, and this team of researchers say they can do what others have not, a rapidly administered handheld breathalyzer test for COVID-19. It's a device researchers say delivers fast and accurate results inexpensively. If you ask a sick patient to volunteer and just blow into a device, they will tire themselves out breathing for 15 minutes into a commercially available device. What we did was we came up with a user-friendly disposable handheld box, 3D printed, where a patient would need to just breathe once or twice, and that is sufficient for detection. The breathalyzer is now being developed for more than COVID-19. It would also help identify influenza A and RSV in addition to COVID-19 in one breath. One breath test in under a minute. To get a reading whether you are positive or negative. So this technology is essentially a phase change which takes place from air to a liquid medium, but keeping the particles in air at the same time in the liquid intact for detection. The engineering of the breathalyzer is happening inside Rajan Chakrabardi's laboratory. He's an associate professor in the Department of Energy, Environmental and Chemical Engineering at the McKelvey School of Engineering. This experiment mimics the exhalation of aerosols from humans. It's called a chest device, mimicking coughing, hacking, sneezing, and talking. And we will show that how the breath box collects it. For participants in the breathalyzer's clinical trial, Chuck Rabardi says doing the test is as simple as the researchers insert a straw into the device. A person blows into the straw. The aerosols from the person's warm breath collects on a cold surface inside the device, which are then read by the biosensor. Chuck Rabardi says the engineering of this box and straw aerosol technology is inspired from an experience observing a child with a juice box. We were struggling with it for almost a year when I was traveling on a flight from Japan to New York. Next to me, there was a kid who was playing with a straw, trying to blow his own breath into that box which was empty and he was trying out all sorts of fancy things he was blowing into the straw closing the end from the other end he wanted to really deposit a droplet and then finally he discovers is that if he freezes the straw by dipping into like cold water and he blows hot air from his mouth and he sees one drop like forming this is after struggling with it for two or three hours and then it stuck me we could do a similar thing with the device and it worked. It just slides down and deposits on the biosensor. The other key technology is the biosensor. That's where Dr. John Cerrito, professor of neurology at Washington University School of Medicine and Dr. Carla Udi, an associate professor of psychiatry, step in. The biosensor work and the protein work is usually done in my laboratory in the Department of Neurology. The breathalyzer uses a biosensor adapted from an Alzheimer's disease-related technology. Cerrito and Udi developed a decade ago. And we had the idea, can we convert this for something for COVID instead? Transferring what we knew about creating electrochemical biosensors for Alzheimer's disease to make it specific to COVID. And now 2024 is a big year for the research team. They recently received a $3.6 million grant from the flu lab an organization that funds efforts to defeat influenza. The money is used to adapt the initial COVID-19 breathalyzer to screen for influenza A and RSV in one breath. We're also trying to expand this to detect other targets. So any other antibody that, um, that we can develop and attach to these chip-based electrodes could then be used to screen for the flu or RSV or fungal targets or other pathogens, including emerging pathogens or bioterror threats in future designs. We can measure proteins very quickly um, and very sensitively. The grant money is helping the team with clinical trials. The results are looking really positive. We're at the point where we need to convert that into a commercial product. For original programming and award-winning content, explore hecmedia.org. Find all of your favorite genres, including the arts and sciences. 
go in depth with the latest research, get insight into new technologies, learn about breakthrough discoveries. Find it all in one place. Explore HECmedia.org. Hi, I'm Marilyn Bradley. I have this special exhibit at Webster Arts, number two summit, that shows my retrospective from the 1960s to now. I started out in high school uh, working in a pathology lab, and one of the doctors was writing a book and needed some drawings. So consequently, I had never had any art at all, but I said, okay, you know, as a high school student, you can do anything. So I did the drawing, and because of that, when I applied for colleges, I got a scholarship at Washington University in chemistry. About two years after going through all those horrible classes <laughs> and not having a chance to relax, I took some classes down at the art school. I thought I better learn how to draw. So I ended up going into advertising illustration where you really had to know how to draw. After I graduated, my first job was in architectural illustration. I knew nothing about architectural illustration, um, but I took some books and learned on the spot. It didn't last very long. It was about six weeks and he realized I didn't know anything. After that, I ended up doing fashion illustration because St. Louis at that time was fashion headquarters. So people would bring me shoes and clothes and I would do the drawing and then they'd use that in their advertising. I continued trying to do different things. I got a lot of freelance jobs. And these freelance jobs, I was willing to take anything. I would compete with whoever. Nobody ever knew me because it was always through the mail. And so I signed my name, M. Bradley. That way I could get a lot of industrial jobs and nobody knew. I'd started learning how to paint. I never knew really that much on how to control watercolor, but I was very good at drafting and drawing. So I started working with drawings of the buildings in St. Louis. Since I had already done that background, I was getting better. I learned how to control the watercolors and I started doing watercolors. At that time, not too many people were doing watercolors. It was only considered study for a later painting in oil and I finally got somewhat of a following. I continued working mostly a traditional way of advertising and landscapes and architectural. Eventually, I got tired of doing landscapes and St. Louis landmarks. I have done over 600 St. Louis landmarks and landscapes, and I started changing the drawing and painting into a very geometric style. And in this geometric style, I thought, oh, this is fun, it's different. It's a different way to look at it, where everything is just line and tangents, no circles, no arcs or anything, and it's taken off. I've done that in the last five years now, and I've gotten a reputation for my new direction of geometric transformations. This retrospective at Webster Arts will be on exhibit until February 16th. And the reason for this show is really celebrating the 20th anniversary of Webster Arts. I was one of the original members when it first started. I've been in a lot of the shows that they've had. It's a good way to celebrate, and we'd like to have you come and visit. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. I started Black Girls to STEM because I was really noticing a gap specifically in the region in gender equity as it related to STEM of black girls that was really coming from public schools, inner city, St. Louis, and other majority African American districts. I am a research and development chemist by background education and training. As a child, Cynthia Chapel was strong in math and science, but it was a chance encounter that gave her the confidence to see that talent as a potential career. 
I didn't actually meet a black woman in STEM until I was like a sophomore in high school and she was an engineer who worked for NASA. And so I think it was very much an impression of like, oh, okay, maybe I can do science. After getting her master's degree and working in the private sector, Cynthia forged a new path by creating Black Girls Do STEM. Black Girls Do STEM! The goal of Black Girls Do STEM is really like to get to a point where black women have equitable representation across all STEM fields. As much as we want to trigger curiosity in our young girls for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and build their confidence in their STEM capabilities and their own skill sets, we want to take, again, that integrated approach, that multidisciplinary approach to make sure that kids understand like how career pathways and skills can track across so many different areas that they may or may not be interested in. Through workshops like this, middle school girls can see career possibilities and hear from mentors in various STEM fields. This session ends with a challenge project, build a levy design. Terry, you like whatever you have on your budget is what you're going to use. If you put water on cardboard, it's going to like not dissolve, but it's like not going to work. So if you put the popsicle sticks on it, and then put the tape around it, it might break. I don't know. So at Black Girls Choose Thin, we really want girls to embody a sense of joy in the process of discovery, right? Joy in the process of being challenged. And I feel like that's why I love being a scientist. Here, the girls learn life lessons like persistence and growth mentality. Yep, this is it. It helped at first. Mm -hmm. So when you write your results down, what could you use more of? It helps me solve problems. One experiment we did with balloons, it didn't work out the first time, so we had to do it again. Black Rose Shoot STEM is really, truly a grassroots organization. We really move in and shape our programming and our offering based on what parents and students and community stakeholders are telling us they need. I want to design things when I get older, like buildings. The last class, we did 3D printing. And I like that because it's creative and I like to make different things out of different things. Once our girls exit our middle school strategy or our Saturday Academy, they sort of age automatically into our high school support services, which is math and science tutoring, as we advocate for them to take three years of math and science as high school students, ACT preparation, post-secondary planning focused on scholarship and college access, as well as direct to the workforce pathway. And so I think that's what we want the experience for girls in the program to be. Building real confidence in their critical thinking ability. Being okay with failing and starting over, like fail fast, get back up, let's rethink it. Uh, we do so much design and redesign, test and retest, because it, that, that's, the, that's the process of learning and that's how you sharpen your skills and sharpen your mind. Next week, it's Valentine's Day, the love story of President and Mrs. Grant brought to life through a treasure trove of love letters. Plus, bring your love to the Orchid Show at the Botanical Garden. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.